being in meetings and, and, and saying, well, you know, I guess as an anthropologist, I would see this as X, Y, Z, but you know, whatever, I'm not, I'm not an engineer. And a lot of my twenties and some of my mentors will tell you, they, they tried to coach this out of me and, and thankfully helped it, it succeeded. I went so deep into self-deprecation that, that it was almost like I was counting myself out. And who's going to believe in you if you don't believe in yourself? And so somewhere around my 30s, my early 30s, I realized that all those things that, that, that made me me, people wanted to hear them. People wanted to hear about how my time as a short order cook working as a park ranger in New Mexico makes me think of this business situation different or, or how, you know, my, my, my time touring with my band taught me this about entrepreneurship, not that. And so in short, people do value the different perspectives. You just got to get over your own insecurity early in your career and realize you're not lesser than the standard folks. You're, you're playing with a different deck of cards. All right. Thanks for joining us at the Life of a Career podcast, Mike. Um, before we get started, can you give us a quick description of who you are and what you do? Sure. So uh, glad to be here, Eric. My name is Mike Bechtel. I serve as Chief Futurist for Deloitte Consulting. Uh, and I have a side hustle, as, as my son would say, as a uh, professor of corporate innovation at the University of Notre Dame. Okay. Yeah, that's very interesting. Chief Futurist. <laughs> the- I can't wait to find out how that is even a job um, <laughs> and how you got there. So before we, we get to the end, like what was the beginning like? Is this what you always wanted to do when you were younger? Oh, gosh, no. Oh, man, no way. What You know, when I was little, I I was an only child. And I grew up in a working class family on the south side of Chicago between a steel mill and a landfill. and you know, absent, you know, rich uncles to, to help me guide my journey. I, I relied on the good old fashioned school guidance counselors, which if you think about it, it's like a public defender, right. In terms of career advice, right. You know, that that's their job. They might not give you the differentiated advice, but they'll give you the generally good advice. And, and here was my thing, Eric. I, I always liked reading and writing, communicating and storytelling and, 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 and the liberal arts, if you will. But, you know, I was good at math and science and, and, and what we now call STEM. And, and so I didn't know, I didn't know what to do. I, I just knew that I would try to work hard in all the things. And, and so come high school, when I'm trying to think about where to go to college and what to major in, I remember talking to a, a guidance counselor at the, the, the university where I went, Notre Dame, and, 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 and I remember she said, well, listen, you know, arts and letters majors typically go to grad school, and grad school typically costs at that time mid-90s, you know, about 40 grand a year. Engineers typically go get jobs right after, and they tend to make about 40 grand a year. And that sent me towards a major in engineering. And so, you know, it, it was interesting because it took me all of one semester to realize that this wasn't my tribe. These weren't my people. And it wasn't, it wasn't a cultural problem. It was a format problem. 300 people in a seminar. You know, I, I could learn the stuff in the book. Why am I listening to this guy read literally out of the book? And, and so I said, well, to heck with economics, I'm going to go pick up a different major. So I, I figured, well, what else sounds employable? I'll be a lawyer. So I majored in, in government because that was our, our ver- we didn't have pre-law, right? It was poli-sci. But Eric, I, I realized then, like, these people really like arguing for a living. That's not my jam. You know, no, it, this isn't it either. And, and I looked out the window one day Right. Like, like that scene from a Christmas Carol when, when Ebenezer Scrooge is watching the other kids play, you know, and, and, and and I saw these long haired ultimate Frisbee players. Like, what do those cats major in? 
And one of them happened to be the drummer at that time in my band. I said, Noah, what, what, what is Sheil and these other cats? What do they study? He said, anthropology. I said, well, that sounds cool. And so I picked up a double major in anthro. And now it's 1997 and I've got this government anthropology double major with a minor in philosophy and economics, AKA I didn't know what I wanted to do. And, and I was a geek, right? I was still techie. I was still coding doom servers at the campus computer cluster, you know, OG doom, right? Like doom two. And, um, and because it was 1997, if you could spell www, like people thought you were techie. And so I remember interviewing for and, and, and ultimately getting my first job in consulting largely on the basis of all of my out of class work, right? I was this, this, this poet, this, this anthropologist, all this other jam, but it, it was, it was that technical passion underneath that, that helped me find my first gig and, you know, spent 10 years as an inventor with a large professional services firm, uh, 12 U S patents, many, many clients. Um, I spent a couple of years as a CTO at a former client that taught me the, the, the brass tax side of what it's like to actually run a business, not just help a business. And then I spent the next eight years as a venture capital investor. I, I, I co-founded a VC here in Chicago with a couple of fellas. And, and, and that's all to say that mix of, that mix of backgrounds, that, that liberal arts base with that geeky mojo with the years as an inventor learning about what's possible with those years as an investor learning about what's profitable. They came together in, in, in manifest as my current work as a, as a futurist with Deloitte. Wow. The, how did you get that first job with an anthropology degree? And I know it's a minor in economics, but to go into yeah. consulting with that, like, was there a, a an amazing way in which you crafted that narrative uh, oh to, to get into the door? <laughs> it was, Eric, that's the right question, man. Because while it was not common in the, in the mid to late nineties for a, a, a liberal arts kid to get a consulting job, um, it was also not unheard of. See, I, I've had the opportunity to, to, to guest lecture at my old university and others for nearly my, my whole career. And so I've had this time-lapse understanding of how things have changed since, since, you know, my day, you know, old, old, old guy vibes. <laughs> and the current fetish for specialization is current, right? 20 years ago, people would say without any eye rolls, or any smirk, that they wanted to hire people who learned how to learn, right? That they wanted, they wanted polymaths and Renaissance folks who could cross-pollinate great thinking from different genres into the, the, their, their current task. And so to answer your question, man, you know, one of the things I learned in interviews was what not to do. Have you ever heard the term, Eric, lead with your chin? No. <laughs> you no. Know, so it's a boxing term, right? You know, boxing doesn't get a lot of attention, you know, in, 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 in the, the 2020s perhaps. But um, to lead with one's chin is to open, your, open your, your, your experience with apologies, a.k.a. like, here's my weakness, hit me here. Because if you lead with your chin, they're going to be like, and they'll knock you out. And, and here's where I'm going with this. In my first interviews, I remember leading with my chin. It's like, hi, well, you know, I might just be an anthropology major who, who, who didn't technically study engineering and doesn't really know business, but, and the interviewer would basically hear like, who's this unqualified guy who sounds guilty, right? What I learned was, hi, I'm Mike Bechtel. I study the difference between human cultures and that's surprisingly useful in business because our tacit beliefs and culture matter more to our decision making than any spreadsheet and certainly more than any tool, aka it wasn't about baloney or BS. It was about saying, be proud of who you are. 
don't be apologetic for who you aren't. Because people will smell the tentative insecurity on you. And they don't want they don't want that energy in their in their workplace. But but they do want that polymath who can say, watch me think differently. That's fascinating. Have you found that to be true? The like now that you're much more senior in your career. <laughs> so it it's been a ride. The short answer is yes, but there's a big asterisk on it. When I landed my first job, my first consulting job, um, I was so pumped. I was so stoked because because that consulting job was another color in my rainbow. And, and here's what I mean by that. It's senior year. I've got a, 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 a touring campus rock and roll band. I've got a wonderful uh, girlfriend who would go on to be uh, my lovely wife of 23 years, right? I had this cool major and I had a job. So I felt like I was firing on all cylinders. But dude, on my first day of work, I was miserable. And the reason I was miserable was because I had gone from this basket of things that made me me to being 40 hours a week. I, I, I guess I'm a technology consultant. And that was it. It was like my whole world went from, from Technicolor to just Indigo. Not that Indigo is bad. It's just one color. And so with that came like a, well, it came the return of the apologies, the return of leading with chin, being in meetings and, and, and saying, well, you know, I guess as an anthropologist, I would see this as X, Y, Z, but you know, whatever, I'm not, I'm not an engineer. And a lot of my twenties and some of my mentors will tell you, they, they tried to coach this out of me and, and thankfully helped it, it succeeded. I went so deep into self-deprecation that, that it was almost like I was counting myself out. And who's going to believe in you if you don't believe in yourself? And so somewhere around my 30s, my early 30s, I realized that all those things that, that, that made me me, people wanted to hear them. People wanted to hear about how my time as a short order cook working as a park ranger in New Mexico makes me think of this business situation different or, or how, you know, my, my, my time touring with my band taught me this about entrepreneurship, not that. And so in short, people do value the different perspectives. You just got to get over your own insecurity early in your career and realize you're not lesser than the standard folks. You're, you're playing with a different deck of cards. Yeah, that, that I really appreciate that advice because I think insecurity is actually one of the biggest uh, issues to overcome when you're, you're trying to talk about yourself because it's not something that's super comfortable to do um, naturally. Uh, so. For sure. It, and, and, you know, I, I, I joke with folks all the time that like, you, you know, you can, you, you can, advocate for yourself without being self-centered and, and you can toot your own horn without, you know, being a blowhard to use an old, old term. My, is one of my dad's classics, that guy's a blowhard. What's that mean, dad? It means he tries too hard to, to be cool. Right. But, but yeah, it, we are the heroes we're looking for, but our strengths are also our weaknesses. We're the enemies we're running from. And it sounds very new agey, but I'm here to tell you cliches are cliches for a reason. And that's true. Just getting out of our own head and confidently trying to be our best self every day. It's the best medicine on earth. Yeah, that, that's such sound advice. And I think coming from you, uh, where you are currently to be able to validate that, um, that's amazing. Uh, so quickly... Uh, uh, how did you translate from venture capital to, uh, into chief futurist? Was that an immediate yeah. step or did, were there things in between? So, so venture, 
venture was interesting, right? Because as, as a VC, you you literally sit on the other side of the table from people with one world changing idea after another, right? And and Shark Tank makes it feel very glamorous, very palatable, right? <laughs> it's like for for thirty minutes every Thursday, we're gonna we're gonna have our minds blown and pick our favorite. In reality, it's you know. 30, 40, 50 hours a week of, as, as we, we would say, and, you know, it, I, I don't think this is a problematic term, but, you know, we would say it's about kissing a lot of frogs because if you know, think of the fairy tale analogy, right? Your, your prince or princess is out there. Just got to kiss a lot of frogs first and, and figure out which one it is. Well, you learn a couple things. One, you learn that storytelling matters. There are geniuses out there who can't get out of their own way in communicating their, their world changing something. Right. And in a world where you're hearing eight world changing somethings in a day, if it doesn't make sense in the first minute and a half, it, it, you don't got time for it. And so you learn the primacy of storytelling of sense making, right. In an intention starved world. The other thing you get really good at is you get really good at saying no. I mean, we talked to nearly 5,000 startups and we only invested in 15. Right? And when you think about that that funnel, that pyramid, if you will, it, you, you don't do that in the college style where you're sending out ding letters, Right. It's a stage gated approach where it's a series of conversations that gets increasingly real. And then, you know, you, you ultimately go to terms or term sheet, as we call it, with, with, with a select few. But getting to your, your great question, Eric, the whole experience for me was this front row seat to the difference between what's shiny and what's possible and what's meaty and what's profitable. And th- this, this, this idea of, of wheat from chaff, signal from noise, right? Snake oil from <laughs> salvation. Um, that, that was a skill set that I realized I built and I, and, I, and I liked to put into play. But I simultaneously realized that back to my liberal arts roots growing up, my, my storytelling mojo... I was cast as a critic, not a creator. I I was the suit sitting on the other side of the table from the people having all the fun and I wasn't having fun. And so the futurist opportunity kind of came about as where can I put my skills at discerning winners, right? Prospects, right? The real McCoys from the rest in a way where I could be a communicator, a creator, a a, a, a co-pilot as opposed to um, a banker, right? Nothing against bankers. I mean, there are plenty of people very happy to be VC. VC. <laughs> but, but in my case, I'm like, no, no, no. I, I want to flex these muscles in a different way. And so Deloitte proved to be a, 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 an amazing platform because here's this global firm that helps organizations figure out what's best, right? Best practices. And, and the discussion with Deloitte was, you know, increasingly our clients don't, they, they want one more. They want to know what's next. And so that was a great opportunity to say, hey, same old me, but attached to this, this world-class platform where I can now help, help our clients make heads or tails out of all these buzzwords. Oh, interesting. So there, there was a position that was available. It's not something that you went in and decided to create for yourself? No. Well, okay. So... Right. Good, good, good question. Perfect question. And thank you for it. Um, the need as it was, the, the position, the role, as it was originally kind of construed was, hey, we could really use help researching and making sense out of Horizon 3 technologies. Which, if you think about it, you know, it, it's not that that's wrong. It's just that that's sort of a, a slightly buttoned up, like maybe a vaguely academic way of, of talking about like what's new and what's next. My 
counter to that opportunity, if you will, right? The way I received that opportunity was saying, not no, 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 I want to do X. There's this idea in improv. Have you ever heard about the thing, Eric, in improv where you're not allowed to say but or no? Yes. Yeah, yeah right. I've heard, I've heard that. Right. And, and for, you know, for, for our listeners today that, you know, improv comedy, one of the keys is you're always building and growing. You're not critiquing and shrinking. So if somebody goes like, you know, I'm in a Volkswagen and it's green. You don't say, no, no, it's purple because then you're smushing, right? What you want to say is, yeah, it's lime green and it's piloted by a flying nun. You know, it's that additive energy. And here's why that matters. When d- When I got to talking with Deloitte and they said, we want to strengthen our research capacity around Horizon 3 technologies, I didn't say no. I didn't say but. I said, yeah, yeah, and, right? We can build a model and a framework for helping our clients navigate the future, right? And we can establish futurism as a practical strategic discipline, strategy 2.0, and we can evangelize and access boardrooms and C-suites in new ways. And so that was that kindling, that moment where they said, how about X? I said, how about X prime? They said, how about X prime plus? And we were able to build something that we were both pumped about. Where did you get the confidence to, you know, Deloitte is such a big platform for you to walk in, you know, you know, not, not growing up in the firm, right. But coming in with all these fresh ideas and almost, it's not challenging. Like you said, it's growing with them. Uh, yeah. But how did you kind of come up with that confidence or is that what they were looking for when they brought you in? Well, I, I don't want to make up a numbered list here, but two things pop right into mind and, and, and maybe we can, we can come up with three through N if there's more. One is the folks that, the folks that I now work with and consider dear friends and teammates and partners, right? Um, th- they get half the credit in this story because it, you know, it takes two to tango and, and these great folks willingness to receive what, what they might have received as harebrained schemes, but instead see as um, possibility, as curiosity, as opportunity um, my hat's off because I can only imagine how, how zany I might, <laughs> I might have sounded as, you know, Mr. Future guy. Um, two, I use, I use this analogy, which, which I think is broadly applicable, but, but you can tell me, Eric, if you think this resonates, H- have you, or do you think many of your listeners are familiar with Lord of the Rings? I am not, but I'm sure a lot of the listeners well, are. <laughs> well, I, I won't take us too far down the, the the analogy hole on this one, but I'll tell you, there's this character named Gandalf. And Gandalf, you, you, he's a wizard, and you think he dies in the first book. But then he comes roaring back in the third book, and he's not the same guy. He's like all zhuzhed up. And they ask him, what, what, why are you all kicked up? He goes, well, because I've been off fighting, you know, like dragons and demons for a year. Right. Well, here, here, here's where this connects. And for those of you who, who know the analogy, you, you're all goosebumping and loving it for the rest of you. I'm sorry, but here's the idea. It was my time away from consulting for a decade that I think in part gave me the perspective, the frame, and you know, you call it confidence. I would just call it, the, call it, um, maybe clarity because you can't read the label when you're sitting inside the jar, right? And if I had been a lifelong consulting practitioner, that doesn't mean that I would be lesser than, it just means that I would have a different set of lenses. 10 years outside that jar helped me say, this isn't harebrained. This is what, what, what I believe you need, what I need, what our clients need, right? And, and that's the kind of perspective that comes from getting outside your jar and forcing yourself to collide with unusual suspects and do different things every couple of years. Okay. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. What, what is a day-to-day like as, I guess, a chief futurist? Now that we have the title, it's just so interesting. We went, went straight there. But yeah. what is a day-to-day like? <laughs> yeah, what's, what's, what's going on under there, right? So 
at the end of the day, you know, I hate to let anybody down, but we do not have crystal balls, uh, nor do we have time machines uh, of the hot tub or DeLorean variety, right? Our work really comes down to th this idea, and, and, and there's this quote, Eric, I don't know if you've ever heard it. It's, it's old hat in my line of work, but for folks who haven't heard it, they typically dig it. The future is already here. It's just not yet evenly distributed. It, yeah, it, it's this idea first, well, written by an author, a science fiction fellow named William Gibson in 1982, Neuromancer. But the thought is this, somebody right now, right today, right, is cooking up something that's normal for them that would be novel to us, right? Something that would blow both of our minds, right? For example, OpenAI has been cooking chat GPT for a couple years now. And Newsflash, so have many other organizations been working on generative pre-trained transformers, right? The, the real nerds and wizards among us will say, that's not terribly new. It's impressive. It's well done. It's public. But it might not be new, 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 new. Well, here's the deal. At Deloitte, we have the privilege, and I mean that authentically, not like, like cheesy, right? We have the privilege of working with clients in every country in the world, every sector, every everything, right? And by every, I, you know, asterisk, asterisk does not include whatever. But we can chronicle little faces of what's normal to some that figure to be novel to the rest of us in the next two years. And so what do we do as futurists? I am fortunate to lead a team of about 20 folks who sense what's going on out there, make sense of what it all means and which of these things seem to have legs, again, signal from noise, and then back to that storytelling piece earlier. Make sure that we communicate in a way that gets people to sit up and not, you know, swipe whichever way means no. I don't know. I'm not a, I'm not a gender guy. But, but the, the point being, um, chronicling, not predicting, right? looking at trends that are live to figure out trends that'll be ours in the next couple of years. That's, that's really the name of the game. Oh, that's fascinating. And I think it draws in from your liberal arts uh, background a little bit too, because it's more of the research base, trying to connect the dots, anthropology to a certain extent, right? Connecting it to the person, uh, you know, people. <laughs> Dude, and for me, dude, is a, is a sign of enthusiasm and familiarity. Don't mean presume we're dudes yet, but you're my dude. Um, the the, the cross-pollination between, uh, between different sectors, between different geographies, that's, that's what gets me out of bed in the morning. Because, because here's the thing. People, people intuitively expect that the North American Space Agency, NASA, right, could teach a thing or two to some flyover state insurance company. But here's the truth. The flyover state insurance company could teach a thing or two to NASA. And that's not a roast or a dig, right? There's a temptation today where everything's fractious all the time. <laughs> you know, to say like, whoa! But, but the truth is, Everybody can learn from everybody so long as they get outside of their respective jars. And so you're, you're right. And, and I'm grateful, Eric, that you saw the, the anthropological uh, mojo in, in, in our work, because that's really what it comes down to is it, it's cross-cultural pollination with a mind towards raising all boats. Yeah. It's, it's interesting that it's, it's come so full circle. Um, <laughs> totally. But because we have you here and that you're you you're you have a pulse on the future in a way, right? Yeah, There's no yeah. way you can predict it. Um, I wanted to kind of tap into your mind and, and see like what you think of future for careers, because that's sort of the purpose of our podcast and and trying to help guide students in 
the right direction into the future because some of the careers that exist today may not exist in 20 years. Well, a lot of us are young enough where 20 years later, it still matters that yeah, right. you're going to be in the job force. So, <laughs> so I'm kind of curious, like what type of framework or lens should we have as we look towards that future? Um, and what types of arena should we look at, right? Yep. Is it the research, you know, for example, we had a discussion quickly before uh, this, uh, we started recording about doctors, like, is, do we become doctors or are we going to start specializing in the research end to empower future diagnostic tools? Um, which direction, like, how do we, how do we walk forward, I guess, uh, mm. and hope for the best? Yeah. Eric, it's the, it, the, the number one question. Well, there's probably like a top five. How do you get into VC? Why did you leave VC? Uh, what should I invest in and what should my kids major in? Like that's, that's the Mount Rushmore of questions that a futurist gets. Um, but I'll tell you, uh, you, 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 you've asked it so well because here's, here's the rub. Futurists are secretly historians. Okay. We make, we make meaning out of what's happening now and what's likely to happen next by intuitively or explicitly comparing it to what's happened before. Okay. Um, Mark Twain has this great line. He says, listen, history doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. Well, here's the scoop. My team and I did some research uh, a couple of years ago uh, in conjunction with the World Economic Forum, okay, where inspired by a full size, like Volkswagen size recreation of the first computer built by Charles Babbage and Ada Lovelace in 1840, right? 160 years ago, this thing. If you read the liner notes, if you will, of, of, of this, this giant calculator that they put together, you know, steampunk heaven, right? Brass, monstrous. It was like an abacus on steroids. They talked about three key parts of this bad boy. They said that there was a, a, a mill which would crunch arithmetic like a piece of farm equipment might turn, you know, wheat into flour. They talked about a store that would hold the arithmetic much like a silo would hold grain. And then at the top, they talked about a reader that would stamp out clay tablets so we, you know, muggles could make sense of it all. Well, I'm reading this thing. My team and I are talking about it. And it occurs to us, the whole history of technology and, and technology in the workplace, right, business technology, has been an evolution, right, not a revolution along these three rails since 1840. Think about it. What was clay tablets became punch cards, right? Used by PhDs, right? And then those became command line interfaces used by my parents' generation. They didn't need a PhD. They went to night school. Right? And then we had my group, like, we don't need to read. We have icons and dummies books, right? And then after that, right, the, 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 the you know, uh, millennial and Gen Z folks that I now get to hire, right? Like, they don't even need good posture. They're just back, touch and swipe. It's on a phone. But here's, here's why this matters to your question, brother. The whole history of human-computer interaction has been about the tech gets more complicated, but the experience gets simpler, right? A user manual, what now, right? These things are... E and so the first thing I'd recommend in terms of jobs, in terms of careers is... If you're not working towards simpler interactions with, applications of, uh, integrations with technology, then you're on the wrong side of history. And so when I think about a lot of the buzzwords du jour, the metaverse, augmented reality, virtual reality, mobile computing, ambient experience, um, it's not snake oil. If anything, this stuff is a recognition that nobody wants 17, 16 by nine pixel bed rectangles in their life anymore, right? I, right? 
And that as this kind of business gives way to this, and for those who are audio only, I just threw on a, uh, you know, a, a VR headset and then a pair of glasses. Um, we're actually going to see that that stuff wins, not because it's shinier, but because it's simpler. And so what does that mean for, for jobs? It means learn about 3D modeling, learn about GPU compute, right? learn about using AI and ML to render virtual worlds, learn about online gaming. Learn about immersive online gaming because there's, per our research, right, there's virtually no future, right, where next gen 3D immersive augmented and virtual interfaces aren't going to be seen as simply normal, right? Like my son, he's 10, he collects baseball cards. I think of them as strange online baseball cards. He thinks that the idea of a baseball card on paper is strange. It's just a baseball card. And so the first piece of advice I'd give is long on virtual and augmented realities because it's simpler, not because it's a fad. Okay. Yeah, it's it's being able to attach ourselves to some sort of technological side, right? There's no longer the the creative person who can stand alone or or the the mechanic who can stand alone without the technology augmenting our physical capabilities, right? Well, or it, maybe creating something that helps augment people. Uh, well, that's right. That's right. Because, you know, I talked about these three train tracks, right? And, and then I went deep into human computer interaction, virtual augmented and simplicity. The second, the second track is really all about machines keep getting smarter, right? And so if interfaces keep getting simpler, so jobs around the further democratization and simplification of human computer interaction, going to be a lot of those jobs. There's also going to be a lot of jobs around working with, not against, our AI counterparts. Okay. The most zeitgeisty thing this holiday season was like, have you seen Dali? Have you seen ChatGPT? How about MidJourney? What about Stable Diffusion? Blah, blah, blah. The robots are coming. Here's the deal. They've been coming, right? AI's not new. Larry Tesler from Xerox Research Park, um, back before people thought of Xerox as copiers, Xerox was like an OG Palo Alto research concern, right? Silicon Valley, I'm not sure Palo Alto. But Larry Tesler, one of their leading computer scientists, famously said, AI is just whatever computers can't do yet. And so in 1996, it was, you know, I don't know, predict, predict some data science stuff, right? I mean, ter terrible description, but you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, the data says this, next is likely that. Today, it's the emulation of human decision-making, discernment, uh, poetry, prose, and paintings, right? It's a change in degree, not kind. And the big takeaway, I think, for job seekers isn't, zoinks, the robots are coming for the jobs. They've always been coming for tasks, parts of jobs. But I'll give you an example, Eric. Our creative team for our Deloitte Tech Trends 23, we floated an idea we thought they'd think was nuts. We said, what if we actually use generative AI to create the artwork for this year's report? You could imagine that... Their initial reaction was, heck no, I'm the creative professional. But when they started to use the tools and get a handle on it, they're like, wait a minute, this isn't the Terminator coming for my job. This is the new Photoshop on steroids that I'm going to need if I want to be at the top of my game. And so sure enough, humans and machines, right? We call it the age of with here at Deloitte. Um, Jobs that figure out how to elevate from the um, work-a-day execution and into the creativity and conceptualization, those are the big takeaways with the AI revolution. Right? Eric, I use Dolly as a litmus test to see how creative the human is that's using it, right? Because I've showed it to executives, and the best they can come up with it sometimes is, Show me a sunset on the beach. Like, really? 
that says more about you than the algorithm, man. Right? Then you talk to the person who's just like, I want to see a Starfleet captain in a tutu battling a malevolent sentient Cheeto underwater. And you think to yourself, this guy's going places, right? And so, so I think this idea of working with AI and realizing that the new battleground is in creativity and conceptualization, that would be my advice around how to deal with, with the, the, the rise of the robots. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. But because of these tools, as they, as they start sort of simplifying tasks for us to a certain degree, like um, I was taking a look at Runway ML, which is a almost like Adobe Photoshop for video editing. And, yeah. and I saw that uh, the Colbert show like production team was able to drastically reduce from like three, four hours of editing time to a few minutes. Yeah. Do you, do you see that the potential could have impacts on like uh, the reduction of certain jobs then? And then I guess what is, what is the way to protect ourselves from, yeah. you know, now that we have to be the best video editor with the tools, Yeah. do I go somewhere else to build the tools or, you know, how should we frame yeah. that? Because there's probably some, I guess, drop off in, 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 um, existing jobs. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. The, w- one of the first things that I, <coughs> pardon me. One of the first things that I I'd, I'd submit per our research is that it's useful to think less of jobs and more of tasks. Here's, here's what I mean by that. When you think about jobs, you think about livelihoods, you think about incomes, families, mortgages to be paid, um, you know, car payments to be met, student loans to be serviced, right? And that understandably creates a, 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 a vivid emotional response, okay? When you think about tasks, you think about parts of your professional day, okay? And so this softens the discussion, makes it a little less visceral. Like, what about me? And a little bit more about, would you like to have a better professional day wherein you are freed to work on higher order problems and more uniquely human stuff? Suddenly people are like, yeah, tell me more. And Bill Gates had this quote. Well, it's attributed to Bill Gates. I haven't been able to confirm that, but the quote's great regardless. He says, success means having better problems to solve. I love that quote because, because, you know, people were like, like, why malaria, sir? You know, and he's like, well, I, you know, I've unlocked the billionaire achievement now disease, right? Well, here's the thing. So too does automation, right? Automation means better problems to solve. We talked to American Airlines, right? AA. They said, listen, we had folks working from 10 p.m. till 2 a.m., every night aligning planes to gates. We gave them the opportunity to participate in the training of an AI ML system that would change that task to take two and a half minutes automatically every night. But here's the thing. They didn't lose their jobs. They lost that lousy middle of the night task. And their new job is in the sunshine during the day, dealing with higher order issues like flight delays out of Chicago, right? Or weather or whatever. And so will tasks change? Heck yeah. And for those who see the video here, it's this gesture of like, it's it's that, right? It's like whatever we were doing, now we, we get to do that. But when through that long lens of history, you go, it's kind of been that for 60 years. We're just noticing it now because mechanical muscles, robots, that's automation in the warehouse, the workshop. That's been a thing for a generation. But only recently are, I think, white collar professionals, creative professionals, and executives saying, me too? It's like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> us too. Mm. Yeah, that that makes a lot of sense. I. I never thought about how it has actually already been happening. And it's the first time it's just hitting white collar workers where 
I think everyone else is starting to notice and talk about it. But you're right. The <laughs> the trend line has always been there. It, it, amazing. Um, it, it's amazingly liberating to think about um, certain futures and the present as ch- changes of degree, not kind, of evolutions, not revolutions, of a step on a journey we've been on and will be, and not this discontinuity that's altogether new. I mean, so many people, right? This meme going around last year after COVID of like, I long for precedented times, right? So much of this, so much of this stuff is precedented. It's just that the declaration of everything is unprecedented and discontinuous. Uh, You get more clicks. (laughs) You get more, more page views when you when you frame every last thing as an unprecedented revolution than as a step on a journey that's been going forever yeah i there's a quote that i saw from you re- recently in a video that you did uh and i just wanted to bring it up because i think it's somewhat aligned with that but it really honestly this is taking off in a different direction because you were talking more about business, but I love this quote where you said, if you're building today's solutions with tomorrow's currents in mind, uh, you can get your preferred tomorrow a little ahead of schedule. And I just, I really love that. Could you just kind of explain a little bit about that quote and how it might be applied to to careers? I know that you were more referring to like a business, but I just love that statement. Thank you. I'm, I'm, thank you. I'm grateful for your, you're checking that out and, 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 and that you dug it. Um, so, so if you agree with the conceit, not just the quote, but the concept that the future is already here, it's unevenly distributed. And with this idea that we're on a journey together and where we are right in, in that journey is less important than the fact that we're all on it together. You, you start to realize that, that we can, that, that an acceptance of where we're headed allows for purposeful, intentional shortcuts to those desired futures. And I know that sounds very abstract. And so I'll give you an example. <clears throat> if we believe, per my earlier comments on our research, that user interfaces are only getting simpler, right? That the technology gets more complicated, but the experience is all about um, sort of self-revealing, you know, natural capabilities. Supposedly, Michelangelo said, the greatest form of sophistication is simplicity. Then what, what a student today, right, or a job seeker today, or someone trying to figure, figure out what they want to be when they grow up today, could say is, you know what? Maybe we don't build the, the PC version of this app at all. Maybe we jump straight to making an AR VR native app. Heck, Maybe we jump straight to building something that feels even a little further out because, you know, cliche after cliche, but they're cliches for a reason. Wayne Gretzky, you don't skate to where the puck is. You skate to where the puck is going, right? They, they, they always asked him, like, like how, how are you so good? He's just like, well, I, 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 I see it's going there, so I skate there. <laughs> so if you're an entrepreneur, right, build your business for 2030, right? If, if you're a... If you're a teacher, right, build your skill set for student, you know, leaders of 2040, right? Whatever you're doing, skate to where the puck is going. Because back to our opening, Eric, the, the early in our careers, when we're students, when we're young professionals, we, we, we worry so much about norming to today, right? That we forget that the real action, whether you're an entrepreneur or an employee, Right? Whether you're a teacher or not for profit, you name it, the action is informing what happens tomorrow, right? And so, so humbly, I would argue that you know you want to do the minimum viable level of fitting in that's required to sustain <laughs> sustain your pay and your your participation in in whatever you're doing. But you want to spend the rest of your time sharpening that saw uh, to win to win tomorrow's game. I love that. Uh, that's such great advice. Actually, it's it 
it generated some thoughts in my mind of where to potentially take the content as well. I was like, why am I not in the metaverse with this? <laughs> if, if we're building to 2030, this is something that we need to think about. So yeah, I really appreciate that. Um, before we close out, is there anything else? I know you've already provided so much insight. Is there anything else that you'd like to share and impart to our audience? Oh gosh. Well, three three shorties and and I promise they're shorties first but my folks always told me that, you know you, you start and end with gratitude and, and Eric I thank you uh for for having me today cuz I it's it's not lost on me that it's a it, it's a privilege to spend time with you and you in your audience so that's one uh two um back to skating where that puck is going uh, there's a VC by the name of Paul Graham well-known, well-regarded, uh, founded Y Combinator, the, the oft-described Harvard for startups. And um, he said, listen, the best time to act when you're dealing with an exponential right, is when it still feels too early. Right? And, and if you think about that, right? Like, like this thing doesn't move the needle. That thing doesn't move the needle. That thing, whoosh, oh, I missed the needle. So, so the second thing I'd recommend you, you know, you, after my gratitude is um, for all of you thinking about making moves, um, the best time to do it is yesterday. Second best time is right now, right? Um, somewhere in distant ninth place is tomorrow, right? And then three, um, you know, as my, my 16 year old son Brady would say, <laughs> you know, like, and subscribe, man. I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm active on LinkedIn. Uh, which, which is, you know, classic for an oldster like me, but that's cool. Uh, I share, uh, field notes from the future just about every day, little tastes of novelties that again, y'all might find interesting or passe and either way that's cool. But, uh, or you could check out our Deloitte tech trends research, um, at, um, at, at the link that, uh, we're, we're, I believe Eric's providing for you here in the, in the notes and or recording. But other than that, man, just thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we'll definitely include all those notes. Uh, and I will definitely be following your LinkedIn now uh, because I am curious about the future and I think it has a huge impact on us. And I am so grateful uh, and honored that you you were open to sharing um, this time with us. Uh, I mean, Chief Futurist of Deloitte. <laughs> this is, to me, it's a really big deal. And to have that level of insight um, is amazing. So really appreciate you joining us at the Life of a Career podcast, Mike. Dude, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Hey, thanks for joining us at Mentor Access. If you like what you just watched, please click like and subscribe and also hit that bell so that you get notified when we have new videos come out. Thank you for supporting our mission.